Hi, my name is Charlene Bamboat, and I'm the director of If From Every Tongue It Drips, which is playing in the Forum Expanded section of the Berlinella uh, in, this year, in 2022. Um, the film looks at the way that uh, queerness and specifically lesbian desire has been sanitized through Urdu poetry in South Asia from the 1850s onwards. And it looks at that through the lens of the a queer couple that live in Sri Lanka at the moment. Can you see? Yep. Can I translate? Yes, please. The word rekta literally means like mixing or stirring something. And Urdu poetry began as a like a macaronic verse. Ashik, Dogana, Sakhi, Khudi ka Aina. होंट अलेदा और थूक की बूंदे मैटर से टकरा गई हमारी बीच वाली जगह में पोएट्स हु रोट द पोएम्स वर रिमूव फ्रॉम द कैनन द लैंग्वेज ऑफ द पोएम व्हिच वाज अ मिक्सचर ऑफ डिफरेंट लैंग्वेजेस हैड टू बी क्लेंज्ड और प्यूरिफाइड एंड देन ऑफ कोर्स लास्ट बट नॉट द लीस्ट द कंटेंट विद ऑल इट्स सेक्सीनेस एंड डिजायर एंड प्लेजर वाज नॉट ओके and then god forbid desire for women for one another oh god right hence matter is an unfolding an involution it can't help touching itself god help touching itself hi welcome to the tadi tv my name is jean borbobak this is the 36th tadi award and this time we are discussing the film if from every tongue it drips hi charlene welcome to the Teddy TV. We are very happy to have you here. Um, can you just tell us first what was the driving force behind behind making this film? Sure. Um, hey, thanks for having me. Um, I was I've been thinking about Urdu poetry, specifically this very queer version of Urdu poetry from the 19th century for a couple of years. Um, and so I just been reading it, researching it also at the same time really been thinking about quantum entanglement and theories around quantum physics and then somehow the two just kind of blended in my head <laughs> and with that uh, last year i decided to make the film with the two friends of mine who live in sri lanka who end up being the main characters of the film right and like can you tell us a bit about this way how quantum physics and this specific form of queer poetry met in your concept I think the way I was thinking about quantum physics is um more so in thinking about theories of uh listening and being together but apart also thinking about these ideas around here or there and how can they they exist yeah. simultaneously from different places and this very much comes out of me like being in a diasporic position having grown up in Pakistan and then moved to Canada and always existing within different realms but also it was exacerbated last year by covid and trying to make work and be connected with mm. people in different places simultaneously and so with the film i just kind of leaned into that process it's not very different from other work that i make which is also very much thinking about space and time almost simultaneously um and so this um i guess the the parameters around social distancing and not being able to travel and be with friends and all this uh, made me think more about it in a very practical way Yeah. Um but then it also filtered in very conceptually to what I was thinking. And then with the Urdu poetry, um the connections aren't exactly overt. I guess it's more about me trying to navigate uh how language translation, poetry and then queerness coming out of a very specific time period in South Asia can also be thought about from a very contemporary standpoint. And so then the two just kind of blended in together. <laughs> yeah, right. Um it's it's very interesting um and i'm very curious about the practical elements of of all of this how you navigated the shooting of this film um and like the different participants who who took part in this like this bit of a collective element in in creating the film yeah no definitely there was a collective element and the film even began before shooting like a lot of the a lot of the film started with conversations with myself and 
the sound designer who's also a friend of mine uh, mm. called Richie Carey and he lives in the UK and Scotland and so we just started writing each other almost these like letters about about our lives as a way to connect at this weird time but then also very much about the types of work we want to make and so that started conversations around sound design and sound production um, and then last summer in about Ju June July um, or in 2020, June, July, I reached out to two friends of mine who I've known for many, many years who live in Sri Lanka and asked them if they wanted to participate in this film with me. So what they would do is they would send me videos of their daily life um, and they would send it to me in whatever way possible, like Dropbox, WhatsApp, mm -hmm. all these different ways of communication. And then I would just collect the footage. And then when the editing process came, I used all that footage to create the film. And the sound was created... Um, the, all the all the visuals are predominantly from Batiklo in Sri Lanka, where the two characters live. But the sound was created between Scotland, Montreal, where I am, and then Batiklo there. So we oh. we did all these like listening exercises together, where we recorded sound simultaneously um, from our different positions, and then Richie, the sound designer, mixed it all into the film. Yeah, and also the captions of the film were quite important to the process as well, which also began before the film was made. Um, so I was having a lot of these discussions with this group that I was captioning the film with called Collective Text, also based in Scotland, about how to navigate these things. So it very much was like different layers and context coming together to create yeah. something like this. Yeah, it was super fascinating to see for sure. And um, I thought what was very intriguing is this kind of like these idiosyncrasies and discrepancies between sound, text and image and how that like at the same time sort of framed this whole film and, and, and the whole narrative of it, but then how it unframed these concepts of time and history and and, and, and like relationality um, between the different time periods. Um, can you talk a bit about this aspect of the film? That's a good question. <laughs> I guess I was thinking about this also in terms of time and mm. non-linear time and how, I guess because I'm drawn to non-narrative filmmaking and often mm. moving through time and space in more intuitive ways, I was also thinking about how to translate history in these ways and then how to translate queerness in these ways which are not often obvious but um, I guess it's more of an intuitive way of thinking about making work um, and thinking about history and how you know events that happened like 150 years ago still affect the ways in which we think and with that I think poetry is very important because of its non-narrative mm. form and so this is something that I've always been drawn to not specifically Urdu poetry but just poetry in general yeah um, and I'm also very much drawn to language because I speak so many half languages and a lot of this film was about translation and because right. many of the cast and crew only spoke like 1.5 of the languages in the film, my, myself too. Mm. And so we were like, how do we navigate between all these different things? And so it yeah. just kind of like came out of that, you know? Yeah, this was this was very interesting, this concept of translation in the film and how like all these different languages like sort of are interwoven within uh, within this this narrative. Um, what would you say, like from a filmic point of view, how did you approach translation, and and how would you say that maybe I don't know, like cinema could work as a tool of translation? Well, the so it, it's funny because so the Urdu poetry that I was reading initially yeah. was not written in Urdu script. It was in English. I can read Urdu, but not very well. And also it's 19th century Urdu, so I won't be able mm. to understand it. So I was reading it in its English form. And then I got somebody I know to translate it back to Urdu. And then the two characters in the film are Tamil and speak Tamil, which I do not speak. And so I asked them to translate it to Tamil as well. And so that was kind of the process of one aspect of it. The character in the film who reads the Urdu poetry can speak Hindi, which is very similar to Urdu spoken, but she can't read it. So then we had to translate it back to English so that she could read the text, but it was written in English, but transliterated from Urdu. So there was just all these different layers 
going on around translation. And then um, in addition to that, the captioning, I feel, was another level of translation in the sense that it allowed not just for a deaf audience or a audience a hard of hearing, but also people who maybe don't understand the context or wouldn't necessarily understand the context of the place and the history that the film is speaking about. I think it added another layer of contextual translation to it. Right. Um, and so there was all these different things being navigated simultaneously. Also, my editor is Palestinian and he can read Arabic so he could read the Urdu text, yeah. but didn't understand the word. So we all kind of worked in this kind of mishmash, like hybrid way, which was quite interesting because it also allowed us to think about how we understand each other in between all these phrases and sentences and words, which also I feel poetry does really well is like all those in between moments. Right. Um, and how do you navigate those? Right. Um, it was interesting to see how this interconnectedness of, of uh, colonialism and queerness unfolded uh, within the film. Can you talk a bit about this very specific context and the relationship of these of these two? I've always been interested in how like certain histories get written out, especially when it comes to like nationalist histories. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I guess my interest lies predominantly within a South Asian context. And I know that's a very broad term to to use because everything is quite specific. Um, however, with this film, I was trying to capture how a rebellion in 1857 in India, which started the Indian national movement, which then led to the creation of all these different countries, um, was kind of rooted in the purification of the arts, which was also rooted in the purification of, of queerness or like gay and lesbianism at the time, um, specifically through the arts. So how does a ripple effect like that kind of resonate today? And what does it do today? Because I've spoken with a lot of poets who read and write and are scholars of Urdu poetry. And it's quite rare that people understood Rekhti, which is the one that I'm speaking of. Like people were really surprised when I told them that, yeah, this existed and it came out of the night, like the late, the 1900s and the late 1800s. And so it was quite an interesting thing to have these conversations with people about, because we just imagined a certain thing of how the past is. Um, but actually it's very different than what we think. So it was kind of nice to like parse through that and also think about it through our contemporary lens because what do we know as queerness now? And at the time, I'm speaking very specifically about lesbian poetry. It was like, like people who identify as women having like sexual relations or intimate relations with other women at the time um, of, of this. So it was quite like quite interesting to think about and also the impact of nationalist movements, which are predominantly like male driven, how that affects all this stuff and actually purifies and sanitizes all these mm -hmm. like kind of messy histories, you know, which we like yeah. to conveniently not think about. Yeah, that's right. Um, the uh, one aspect was that just kept on coming up to me while watching the film and now as well when we were talking about it is um, how sort of like the formal way how you approached this whole topic is also seems to be somewhat inherently queer. I don't know if you would agree with that or, or what's your take on that. But yeah, I'm, I'm just very curious. I, I agree with you, but I could never, I've never been able to actually pinpoint what that queerness is. It's, it's difficult, just yeah. it, it, like, but I know it's there. <laughs> I yeah. just never know how to talk about it in such clear ways. And I think maybe that's also part of it, right? Yeah, is that I would say so. You can't really peg it down and maybe, and I'll, not maybe, it is okay not to be able to like hold it down in this, what does queer mean? Like I can never answer that for you, right. but it's just yeah. almost like a feeling. I'm like, yes, I want to use this found footage. I want to use all these different things that I've been collecting over the few, over years. So it's almost like the research comes in too and somehow queers the way in which we think about time and history and space and relationships and things like that. Yeah, exactly. How like this, how the film kind of debunked this idea of a linear history of time flowing in, in a progressive way from like A to B or something like that. And, and I thought that was very very intriguing and just like really at the core of also the form, not necessarily just the con the contact or like, yeah, mm -hmm. the content of the film. 
yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that, that, that was uh, fascinating for sure. Okay, great. Um, Charlene, thank you very much for, for being here with us and talking about the film. Um, the film screens in the forum expanded. Um, and yeah, um, I'm wishing you the best um, on behalf of the entire Teddy team. And yeah, um, we're going to see each other soon. Thanks for having me. <laughs>